Choose not the path of fear, but that of faith. Stand with me. The petals have begun to fall from Nimloth the Fair, and this is not a good sign for the people of Numenor. Omens and portents are looking grim all around, but all is not lost. Not yet. Will everybody cling to hope, or will they give in to fear? Welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed from Episode 4 of Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. So now it's time to remember the first words spoken at the premiere of this series. As Galadriel said, Nothing is evil in the beginning. The line comes directly from Tolkien, spoken by Elrond in the book of the Fellowship of the Ring. His version of it is, for nothing is evil in the beginning, even Sauron was not so. So this theme comes into even sharper focus in episode 4, from the main title sequence onward. And speaking of that main title sequence, I think it's time that we break it down, because some of you have already pointed out that this main title sequence, that shows sand turning into shapes with the power of music, evokes the song of Ainur, which happens at the very beginning of the Cimmerillion. Before time began, Aya was sung into existence. Aya means the world in Tolkien speech. At the dawn of creation, the creator created the Ainur, and the greatest of them was Melkor, who is the big bad of this entire series. But even Melkor was not evil at the dawn of creation. Now this being who would go on to become the Dark Lord Morgoth became impatient and desired more power. He lost the faith and became resentful that there were secrets that he was not yet privy to. He wanted to create greatness of his own, and his selfish thoughts brought discord to this great music when it was sunk. We see this happening in the opening sequence, when the dark, slithering corruption comes sliding in. The Creators of this series have confirmed that this is what they wanted the opening credits to evoke, the music of Ainur, and it's only proper that the main title theme is written by Howard Shore, the Academy Award winning composer for all six of Peter Jackson's movie adaptations of Tolkien. And the great Bear McCreary takes the baton from him and writes all the gorgeous music that we hear in the series itself. Now, if Melkor had never grown resentful, then everything would have been just fine, there would have been no conflict, and Tolkien's lore would have comprised of one very brief, boring chapter. This is fantasy, but the defects of real human beings find their way in, cause conflict, and make the story applicable. Tolkien himself preferred that people refer to his work as being applicable and not allegorical. Resentment, secrets, and the desire to attain more power, and the feeling that you were entitled to that power, is a theme that runs through every storyline in this episode. Even when the power being sought is going to be used to avert disaster, it becomes something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sauron is a great threat, but he's not the only source of corruption there is. Like Melkor showed us at the beginning of time, conflict can arise from within with no help from anyone. The episode's title is The Great Wave, and it is the price of arrogance. Past a certain point, this wave cannot be avoided. We're reminded once again of Gondor as we join Queen Muriel as the main audience chamber of the Numenor looks exactly like the upper level and battlement of Minas Tirith, as depicted in Return of the King. Muriel dreams of a great wave sweeping over the entirety of Numenor and then laying it to waste. The Numenorians believe the sea is always right, so she knows that something somewhere is off, and this disaster has to be averted. Will it be averted? Well, did you you seen Numenor in the movies? Um, look, Doug, anything can happen. Muriel's vision of the Great Wave is something that was all too real for Tolkien himself. In his letters, he writes often that the image of an ineluctable wave coming up out of the sea and to engulf the land was a recurring nightmare of his. He freed himself of this nightmare by writing it into the history of Numenor, and he also gave a similar dream to Faramir in The Lord of the Rings. Now, that's in the Third Age, though, and Faramir obviously had Third Age troubles on his mind. But in the movie Return of the King, the dream was transferred from Faramir to Eowyn. I dreamed I saw a great wave. And since Faramir and Eowyn are soulmates who end up married, it's fair that Jackson and company had her talk about the dream and not him. When the guildsmen of Numenor talk about Galadriel whispering poison into the queen's ear, we can't help but think of Sauron and how he will eventually do the same thing to many characters, if he isn't already. Galadriel is trying to help these people, but the Numenorians are long past giving respect to the elves or the Valar, who gave them this island in the first place. Chancellor Farazan, who probably goes to bed looking himself in the mirror, talks to his son about stagecraft, and he makes it clear that his ambitions are not small. Farazan's son is an invention for this show, and wouldn't look out of place in I, Claudius. The guildsmen are worried about elves infiltrating their workforce. Workers who don't sleep, don't tire, don't age. But they sound more like this. They did your job! They've gotten by just fine without the help of the elves for some time, and they don't want to be accountable to anyone or have someone judge them in any way. They have forgotten their history, including how they ended up on this island in the first place. They accuse the queen of being blind and possibly an elf lover. Now, we've already seen in the opening that the queen sees things much clearer than anyone else on this island. And as for being an elf lover, um... What have the Romans ever done for us? 
Farazan joins them and reminds them all that they are of the Adain and the House of Elros, as well as Armanellos, which is the great structure of the rulers. The Valar raised the island, but these men built everything on it with no help from anyone, and as he says, it is the triumph of our civilization. Farazan starts by criticizing this rabble, but he soon stokes their righteous anger even hotter than it was before. Their ambition was small, and his is great. We see just how easily Farazan is able to play on their pride and manipulate the people of Numenor, and Sauron is nowhere in sight. For by the calluses on my hands, I swear that elven hands will never take Numenor's helm. And to put everything well and truly over the top, he gets everyone drunk. Drinks all round! That should help. The guy tells it just like it is and talks about jobs. What could go wrong? His son flirts with Allendil's daughter, who you'll recall is another invention of the show. Perhaps they'll both sail away to the non-Tolkien character convention that the History of Harfoot storyline is enjoying this week. Anything can happen with these two because they are not beholden to any canon or lore. He offers her wine from the vineyards near the Meneltarma, with the Meneltarma being the central peak of this entire island. It is sometimes referred to in Tolkien as the Pillar of Heaven. When Galadriel presents Muriel with a filthy parchment that bears the marking of the evil contingency plan, we're reminded of Gandalf showing Thorne a similar looking scrap in the opening flashback of the second Hobbit movie. Promise of payment. When she tells Muriel that she suspects Halbrand is a king of the Southlands, Muriel cracks a joke about Elendil being an emperor. Not a great joke, but Muriel will be performing her tight five at the comedy store next week. So what's the deal with elves, am I right? Elendil won't ever be an emperor, but he will eventually be the high king of the Dunedain. So take that, queen chuckles. Muriel doesn't like hearing that the task of defeating Sauron isn't finished. They were once in the fight right alongside the elves, and they got a nice island out of it. So now they have to go back and fight again? Muriel calls Galadriel's call for men and elves to unite again ambitious, which is rich when you consider what the very ambitious Farazan is currently doing. Galadriel does not back down, as we've now come to expect from this show's version of the character, when she says, There's a tempest in me. We know that she is not just being metaphorical. Treacherous is the sea from the foundations of the earth. Muriel does not like her talking about her father, Tal Palantir, so Galadriel gets thrown in prison. King Thranduil will eventually deal with smaller problems in a similar fashion. Stay here, if you will, and rot. Isildur, meanwhile, still hears his name being called from the western part of Numenor, which we visited in episode 3. It is called Eldalande in Tolkien, which translates to Elf Haven. Tolkien wrote that this port was the most beautiful haven on Numenor, so whatever is calling to Isildur may be coming from there. The mysterious voice coming out of the bright sunlight is more interesting to Isildur than the menial task of manning his rope, so he just lets the rope go. Once again, his interest in things beyond his reckoning is guiding him more than duty. Destroy it! His actions get both him and his friends kicked off the ship, even though he was only looking to be kicked off himself. He doesn't realize that his actions affect other people, but here's the scene when he eventually learns that lesson. One of his friends calls him out on all this. Leave it to you to get kicked out for something you never earned in the first place. And we think of Aragorn an age later and how he wants nothing to do with the status and title that he was born with. I do not want that power. I have never wanted it. When his friend says, The real problem is him. And that's not going anywhere. He has no idea how prophetic he is being. Now we get our first look at Adar, and he is indeed a corrupted elf. Now nothing is evil in the beginning, but something has turned this particular elf to nefarious ends. Because he is an invention of the show, we don't know what happened to him. We only know that his visible scars dominate part of his face, and it reminds us a little of Thranduil talking about Dragonfire. I have faced the great serpents of the North. When he gives one of the orcs a mercy killing, we see real emotion in Adar's eyes. You'll remember that Adar translates to father from Elvish, and all of these orcs may be calling him father because he is breeding these orcs himself. The look on his face shows that he might even care for them, unlike other characters who breed orcs. Do you know how the orcs first came into being? They were elves once. The other orcs treat this fallen orc with a lot more respect than the orcs of the Third Age do. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boy! Arendir tells Adar that he was born in Beleriand, which is a huge region in the northwestern Middle Earth during the First Age. It was completely destroyed in the War of the Wrath and wiped off the map, and the only part of it that survived is Linden, seen on this series as the realm of High King Gil-galad. Now, because Beleriand no longer exists in the Second Age, we can assume that Arendir was present in the First Age. We can also assume the same of Adar as he talks 
talks about walking in Beleriand himself, referring to the mouth of the river, which is likely a reference to the mouths of the river Syrian. He says that Arandir has been told lies, lies that run deep, like the corruption that we see constantly spreading under the surface of Middle Earth. He speaks of the creation of a new world, which may be a directive from Sauron, or it may be just a thing that this guy wants to do. For all we know, Adar might even be having his own little rebellion against Sauron. Only gods can do what they want to do, and as he says, I am no god. When someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes! In terms of Tolkien lore, Adar might not be a god, but Sauron is, or at least a demigod, called a Maiar. And Adar does follow all of this up with a not yet. Not yet. So he may be looking at something more powerful with envy, like Melkor once looked at Eru, and how the Numenorians now look at the elves. What are you? At the very least, we'd bet that Sauron has promised him something that the elves, and possibly the Valar, have denied him. I mean, the character is an invention for the show, so who knows? So is not Sauron? I don't think so. I think he's just Adar, the corrupted elf. Famous character. Now, Bronwyn has taken all of the Southlanders to safety in the former Elvish Watchtower, and we're reminded of the people in Rohan seeking safety in Helm's Deep. Bronwyn also takes charge, much in the same way that Eowyn does before Theoden arrives. Where is the rest? This is all we can say, my lady. Her son Theo still has a haircut that hides his ears. So that's interesting, isn't it? The ears make all of the difference. Right? Bronwyn and Anadir are trading looks, but they may have already traded much more than that. When he goes scavenging for supplies, we see the sun suddenly get clouded over. Already, we are on high alert. Without the protection of the sunlight, the orcs will be on their way. And that's exactly what happens. And Theo is attacked by an orc who shares the tradition of licking blood off of knives. <laughs> When Theo uses his blood-powered sword hilt to defend himself, the orc recognizes it and asks, where'd you get that? Now Theo escapes the orc after igniting the hilt, and when they go shouting to the others, he says, I found it, I found it, which makes us think that this isn't just any other blood-powered sword hilt, it's an important blood-powered sword hilt. So what do you think it is? I think it's an Ekra sword from Thor Love and Thunder. Really? No. And I honestly have no idea what this thing is. The orcs won it and it bears the mark of Sauron's contingency and it extends like a lightsaber. I mean, you're the manager, you should know what it is. But I am so smart. Yes, you are. Kelimbor's forge is coming along just fine thanks to Elrond's new arrangement with Prince Durin. You know, when it comes to trying to make things better, but only ended up making things worse, there are fewer examples that are more glaring than Celebrimbor. So look, in our video for episode 3, I think I misspoke at one point and said that Galadriel marries Celebrimbor. She doesn't. Of course, in Tolkien and in Jack Jackson's movies, she is married to Celeborn, who is yet to appear in this series. Tell me, where is Gandalf? Now, Celebrimbor name drops Elrond's father, who we have talked about in previous videos. He was Arendil the Mariner, and one of the most famous elves of all time. When Celebrimbor talks about him, there might be a hint of yearning for the greatness that was once bestowed upon Arendil. Celebrimbor's pursuit of his own greatness is leading him to forge the Rings of Power. Again, we're seeing somebody's ego create an opening for evil to exploit. Now, continuing with the episode's theme of Alliance members, or former Alliance members not trusting each other, Celebrimbor thinks that Prince Durin has a secret, and he's not wrong. We saw that secret chest in episode two. Hey, what's in it? Is it one of the seven rings, like you said? It is not one of the seven rings. We were wrong about that, but... Oh man, I want to see a ring of power. It's the name of the show. I want to see it. The rings of power are coming. They're coming, I promise. And we do eventually get to see what's in this chest, but we'll get there in a bit. Elrond tries to use his political move rings on Disa to get answers, but she proves that she is not one to be trifled with. So recipe for strong gravy. Of all the characters that this series has newly invented, Disa is definitely one of our favorites. She's not blindly covering for her husband either. We see her discussing her false story with Durin in the very next scene. She's fully in on this, and she's smart enough to look around and tell Durin to keep his voice down. Now, they were right to not underestimate Elrond, and he isn't close enough to overhear them. He does see them from far off, though, reminding us of how keen the eyes of elves are. Presumably, he has read their lips because he grasps the secret that they are withholding in the old mine. Specifically, it's the old mine beneath the mirror mirror. Now, though not featured in Jackson's adaptation of The Fellowship of the Ring, the mirror mirror is written about by Tolkien in the Fellowship book in the chapters having to do with the company's trek through Moria. This was a vast lake outside of Khazad-dûm. Now, the original Durin, Durin the Deathless, looked into its waters and saw an image of himself wearing a crown. Because of this vision, he decided to build Khazad-dûm in that location, within the mountain that fed mirror itself. Called Kaled Zerim in Dwarvish, it is called Nen Kenendril in Sindarin, which translates to Lake Looking Glass. So why should I care about any of that? Well, Doug, prophetic visions and dreams have already played a huge part in this episode and will continue to do so. The mention of the Mirror Mirror is a fascinating addition, assuming that you know what the Mirror Mirror is. Count me in for Team Mirror Mirror. Excellent. High five. Elrond gets in through one of the secret dwarf doors that look invisible when closed. Rich crown, kiss the stone, polish your gems and go.
and Duran is not happy to see him. In an episode full of rivalries and old alliances breaking down, the last thing we need is for dwarves and elves to start going at it. Elrond claims he doesn't care about what Duran is hiding, but is this true? He knows that Duran has taken personal offense to him being a bad friend for the last 20 years, and we can't help but wonder if Elrond is using those feelings to his advantage. However, when he talks of friendship, he says, And secrets do not become it. There's nothing that Elrond doesn't know that he hasn't told Durin. He doesn't know what Celebrimbor is going to do with the forge that they're making, so there's no secret for him to tell at that moment. Durin's threat that Elrond's kin will be doomed if he tells anyone the secret once again relates to the anger among the races on this show, sometimes with resentments that go very far back. Durin's line about how fierce dwarven anger is definitely makes us hope that Elrond keeps his mouth shut, because dwarves never forget, and they never forgive. Dwarven anger outlives even Elrond memory and he never forgave and he never forgot so what's in the box a new ore that was discovered by disa which might be dearer than gold better than silk harder than iron as weaponry it would best our proudest blades fans of both the books and the movies will know exactly what ore this is the wealth of moria was not in gold or jewels but mithril when Durin says that it could bring about a whole new age for his people, he's not wrong. Elrond sees no problem sharing the secret far and wide, but Durin knows better. It's perilous to mine. My father has restricted our every efforts. Durin's father, Durin III, is right to restrict those efforts because eventually... The dwarves delved too greedily and too deep. Now, in Tolkien's writing, Mithril could be found in Moria, but also in Numenor. Everyone and anyone wanted it, and it was the most precious metal in the entire lore. Bilbo Baggins received a shirt of Mithril from Thorin. This vest is made of silver steel. Mithril. And Bilbo then passed it on to Frodo. As light as a feather, and as hard as dragon scales. Let me see you put it on. Gandalf lets everyone know exactly what a grand gift that was. I never told him. But its worth was greater than the value of the Shire. In Tolkien, the dwarvish name for it was a secret. Now, on the series, Durin tells Elrond what they call it, as well as what the Elvish translation might be. In our tongue, grey glitter. In yours, something like Mithroud. No, no, it would be Mithril. Though it's a secret for now, and a small token of friendship between Elrond and Durin, it will not remain a secret for long. It's only a matter of time before Celebrimbor discovers this element, because in Tolkien, the elvish inscription that he creates for the dwarves on the doors of Khazad Doom is written in Mithril. More importantly, one of the three rings of power is made from Mithril, that ring being Ninja, the ring kept by Galadriel. It might even be forged by the very Mithril nugget that Durin gives to Elrond. Now, when the mine shakes and part of it caves in, it's a harbinger of the Mithril-related dangers to come. Rush hat in the rhythm, man. Wow, he uses one too many horse metaphors when he's talking to Galadriel. But he's not wrong when he tells her that there is a more diplomatic way to go about getting what she wants, especially in the world of men. Though he's the bluntest instrument around, Hallbrand knows that a needle can be more effective than a hammer, even for the commander of the Northern Elvish armies. The following exchange speaks volumes. It seems to me that you do well to identify what it is that your opponent most fears. Give them a means of mastering it. Not only is that exactly what Farazhan is doing, it is exactly what Sauron will eventually do with the Rings of Power. He will deceive all of his enemies with the rings, a means to master their fears, and then he will secretly create the One Ring, which will master all of the other rings and the ones who wield them. So he is Sauron? That's still a hot theory. So hot right now. But if he was Sauron, why would he spill something like that to one of his chief adversaries? I mean, there's hiding in plain sight, and then there's exposing your master plan in plain sight. And this is pushing it. We're still betting that he's one of the kings who received the Nine Rings from mortal men, or possibly the King of the Dead, who we meet in Return of the King. The dead do not suffer the living to pass. He could also be Fatty Bolger. Really? No. Galadriel might need to learn diplomacy, but she does not need to learn how to take out a bunch of guards. So for all his talk, Farazhan looks at her in fear and lets her walk out, hardly even drawing his sword. Hallbrand almost certainly tells Farazhan where Galadriel is going as a means to advance whatever his own agenda is. When Isildur talks to his sister about no longer being worthy of going into the West, he's talking about going into the Western Elvish region of Numenor. But his words can't help but take on a grander meaning. Going into the West, in the larger sense, means going to 
Valinor, something that the Numenorians are forbidden to do. At this point on the show, going to Valinor is a gift that not every elf receives, which makes Galadriel's rejection of the gift all the more impactful. The theme of far-seeing visions and dreams now hits a new high as Galadriel finds Muriel standing by the king in the tower. As we said in our previous video, this is Muriel's father, Tar Palantir. He was a truth seer who had visions that foretold Numenor's doom. The white tree dropping petals was in these visions, as was the Great Wave. On this show, his visions, and the inability to stop the oncoming doom, has made him bedridden and possibly insane. Muriel doesn't want the truth of the king's condition to get out, so just like Elrond and Durin, Galadriel and Muriel have a secret. If the people knew of the king's condition and what his visions entailed, then faith in both him and Muriel would fade, and control of the people would be lost. Panic would ensue. Hiding him in a tower is the only way to deal with this. As he is in Tolkien's writing, Tar Palantir is loyal to the elves. Now on the show, Muriel tells Galadriel that the king wanted to return to these ways, as well as the forgiveness of the Valar, whose judgment he felt was on them. And he's right about that. Muriel only took up the crown because the Numenorians rebelled against what Tar Palantir wanted, but there was yet another royal secret in the mix. Palantir. One of the seeing stones we talked about in our previous video, the Palantir were forged by Feanir in the First Age. After the Numenorians broke off contact with the Eldar, Tolkien wrote that a Palantir was given to the faithful of Numenor so they could still communicate with them. Elendil eventually brings seven of these seeing stones to Middle-earth. In the series, Muriel says that there are only seven stones in total, and that this is the only one they know the location of. So the show is playing out Tar Palantir's visions and the Palantir seeing stones a little differently, as here, the stone was passed on to him along with the secret. Another secret. Secrets. When Galadriel says that she has touched a Palantir before, it makes sense because Feanor created them and she was his niece. Touching it here, Galadriel gets a full vision of the falling petals and the wave. As Muriel says, it is Numenor's future you saw. Using a Palantir to show a vision of the future is a bit of a stretch. If anything, this scene has more in common with Galadriel's mirror and fellowship. Palantir, they show many visions. Some that will never come to pass. The mirror shows many things. Things that were, things that are, and some things that have not yet come to pass. Muriel is so concerned with the arrival of Galadriel because the vision begins with a visiting elf. Her following line, Only Numenor can bring about her downfall shows that Muriel isn't just another elf hater either. Now, while many Numenorians are resentful of the elves and the Valar, and they're in the midst of fully turning away from them, Muriel knows that the island was given to them by the Valar, and if the Numenorians succumb to darkness, then the Valar can take it back. Once again, Numenor doesn't need Sauron to doom itself. He may come along and speed up the process, but Farazhan's gonna Farazhan. Muriel is damned no matter what she does, so she opts for a quick fix. Get rid of the only harbinger around and hope that nothing else in the vision comes true. Galadriel knows full well that since her away and choosing to not aid in her fight is a choice based in fear, but she also emphasizes that she is no stranger to being the only one who sees the danger when everyone else is painting mission accomplished banners. I know what it is to be the only one. The only one who sees. Do not choose fear, choose faith. Join with Galadriel and let the alliance with the elves be reborn. Let this be the hour that you draw swords together. Ride out and meet them. Ride out with me. Nope. Muriel chooses fear. I choose the danger. Now Theo has gotten out of the well he was hiding in, possibly with a pouch similar to Hallbrand's around his neck. And after a long and wonderful tracking shot of him escaping the village, he's finally on his way back to the tower with the help of Arendir, and they're running from the orcs to the woods definitely reminded us of this. It's working! I know he's working! Run! Arendir also has a nice chance to show off some of his Legolas moves, including this old timer right here. <laughs> When Arndir, Theo, and Bronwyn hit a spot where the sun comes out, we're relieved. These orcs aren't going to go anywhere near them now. So here's hoping that no one ever finds a way to breed an orc that can move freely through the sunlight. He's breeding an army in the caverns of Isengard. An army that can move in sunlight. When Elrond watches Deesa sing to the stone, we get an insight into how deep the dwarves' relationship with stone truly is. They don't just hammer and chisel their way through it, they sing to it, ask for guidance, and ask it to reveal its secrets to them. It is a relationship that no other race in Middle-earth has, making the dwarves truly remarkable. Music playing a part in the creation also calls back to the Song of Ainur, which we spoke of at the start of this video. Durin may have gotten everyone out of the Collapse alive, but when he returns, he says that his father has shut down the entire vein. He's being cautious, but 
Durin wishes otherwise. Even the hottest coals eventually cool. Hey, well, sometimes I wish they wouldn't. The wealth and prosperity that Mithril could bring to his people is already beginning to take precedence over the safety of Durin's people. He's a little too ready to take chances. We hear more of the tale of Elrond's father, Arendil the Mariner, whose deeds were so great that the Elder turned him into a star. I give you the light of Erendil, our most beloved star. Elrond had a new star in the sky, but he couldn't help but wonder what his father would think if he was still there with him. He'd only want one more conversation with him, something that Muriel probably would wish for as well, and something that Isildur is not taking advantage of. Durin's father has not been turned into a star, so Elrond's encouraging him to not waste time that they have together is a touching moment between them. Durin takes the advice and talks with his dad, King Durin III, who talks to him about how dwarves believe that when a new king is crowned, the voices of all his forebearers flow into him. Not only does this echo the passing on of Tar Palantir's vision, it also tracks with Tolkien's writing about the line of Durin. The dwarves believed that Durin I would return seven times, and that certain members of his line would be Durin reborn. As the king says, Forever am I with you, my son, even in anger, sometimes in anger most of all. So though father and son are at peace for the moment, they both believe that there is something more at work when it comes to the elves. They aren't wrong. We can now look forward to Prince Durin going to Linden, hopefully yelling at Gilgalad and maybe breaking his furniture. Bumber. So now that we know the true connection between the Southlands and Mordor, the elvish watchtower is starting to look like it could eventually become the Tower of Kirith Ungul. Nothing is evil in the beginning. The loyalties of the people in the Southlands are about to be tested as well, because Adar has sent Arendir back with a message. That your people may live if you forsake all claim to these lands and swear fealty to him. When the tavern keeper reveals to Theo that he knows all about the sword hilt and that he took from the cellar, he also reveals that he bears the Sauron contingency mark on his arm, just as Theo now does. He also knows about a beautiful servant that we feel he's ready to serve again. Now the people of the Southlands could end up being just as divided as the people of Numenor, and Adar being told that the orcs found something and that this something is in the tower isn't going to help anything. We have to imagine that what they found is this creepy sword thing, but you may have another theory. I don't creep a sword thing it is. So Farazhan may get what he wants when Galadriel gets back on another boat to skip town, but the episode has one final portent to show us. Muriel began the episode dreaming of Numenor's potential fall, but now she sees part of the vision for real. The petals of Nimloth begin to fall. She only has to give one look to the ever-faithful Elendil and they know exactly what they have to do. She must give a speech worthy of Aragorn, but Numenor, as one, must once again believe what their ancestors believed. Potential heroes and hindrances about. Isildur could be helpful, but when we see Hallbrand, well, he's just a big question mark. Because he's Sauron? He might be. Muriel's going to do something that is truly worthy of the Aden of old. She is going to personally bring Galadriel back to Middle-earth. Galadriel, never averse to getting off of a boat, has returned and stands alongside her. They will go to the Southlands in force to counter the rising threat. And when it really counts, Isildur steps up. A vast number of Numenorians are willing to be of service as well. It would seem that faith is not as tiny a thread to hang a kingdom on as Muriel once thought. It can inspire and it can unite. The episode begins with Numenor being distinctly anti elf and wanting to isolate from the rest of the world. Cut to the end and they're all volunteering to go to war. Perhaps resentment, pride, and jealousy have yet to take too strong of a hold. So will this be enough to literally turn the tide and potentially save Numenor? Well, they got a shot. Got a shot. Got a shot. Well, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or feel free to at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.